Well, good evening, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. The world's longest title sequence and the jazz clarinet can only mean <laughs> one thing. It's installment 14, yes, 1414 of Cocktails and Conversation, the weekly virtual speakeasy brought to you by our friends at Breeders' Cup. Nick Luck checking in from Teddington, Southwest London. Mark Tuberty in his beautiful apartment in Brooklyn. We've only seen about two square feet of it for the entire 14 weeks but it still looks Just as good there. as ever mark that you're looking we're, we're, quite spru looking quite spruce you've had a sheer a few little yeah nice you lights know, in the hair I, I heard that Brittany might be a little late tonight and and there's no way that i could try to be as good looking as her but i figured i would try to up my game True. a bit and, and look a little bit more presentable but uh yeah super excited i can't believe we're on week 14 it blows my mind really we are building up a great to... show what are we building up to this week? We're building up to the Haskell at, uh, at Monmouth Park, and we're continuing our run right through the Breeders' Cup Challenge Series, the Haskell Invitational at Monmouth, 5 o'clock till 6 Eastern this weekend on NBC. No danger of it this year running at about 9 p.m., which was the case last year when it was 110 degrees. Quite honestly, Mark, the hottest I've ever been on a racetrack, and we didn't even get the race into our, into our broadcast window. <laughs> And I know you're always dressed to the nine, so that's always going to take the temperature up a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah, don't ask anyone who happened to be on the show. They forced me to wear this this polo shirt. I'll, I'll never live it down. On which note, if I don't do it now, I will forget to wish one of our NBC producers, Billy Matthews, a very happy birthday indeed. Billy, many happy returns from all of us. I hope you're not having to work this, uh, this weekend on your birthday weekend. It is, of course or has been, of course, Saratoga opening day, but very different behind closed doors. At least, however, there was racing at Saratoga. Racing this weekend at Del Mar has been cancelled owing to an outbreak of COVID-19 amongst the, the jockeys in, in Southern California, which is just a stark reminder of the difficult circumstances we've all been working and living in through the last 14 weeks, which is why we brought you this program in the first place, to try and give you some respite, some sucker, some cheer, whatever you require, during these difficult times, and they have far from disappeared. And we've also, Mark, haven't we, tried to raise some significant money for, for charities, important charities during this time through breederscup.com forward slash donate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Bartender Emergency Assistance Program is going strong. I think they've had upwards of $8 million that have been committed to that fund, and it's really going a long way to support, you know, hospitality professionals like myself that are just kind of waiting for the next news. Uh, here in New York City, Outdoor dining has resumed, but there's been a pause on the indoor dining due to everything that's going on throughout the rest of the country. So, you know, many of us are still in limbo. Uh, I'm so thankful to have this to keep me sharp and keep me occupied. But a lot of bartenders don't have anything at the moment. So that fund has been absolutely incredible in supporting us. And thank you to our viewers for, for supporting them so they can support us along with the other charities that we've been featuring. Are you edging your way back to the 21 Club? I, I think it's looking closer to fall. I think after Labor Day would be a safer bet. You know, 21 Club is an interesting because it's such a classic spot and it's right there on 52nd Street between 5th and 6th. And anyone that's been to Midtown Manhattan knows that that's kind of a, a main sort of thoroughfare. You have to keep that street pretty, pretty open. So we don't really envision doing the outdoor dining as much. So much of the history of the 21 Club is inside those hallowed walls, the beautiful toys hanging from the ceilings. Uh, you know, the jockeys out front. So I think we are going to wait for indoor dining to resume. And we're hoping that will happen after Labor Day. So fingers crossed. I gather one or two of you have been having a few problems seeing us this evening and our, our feed has not been going out on on the Facebook stream. If you haven't seen anything so far, 
you've not missed much. <laughs> just Mark and I, just Mark and I shooting the breeze because Brittany, yeah. we are still waiting for. Brittany was en route in a taxi to her to her hotel near Monmouth Park, where she's going to be broadcasting the Haskell for, for NBC this weekend. But she will be joining us very shortly. And we will have some very special guests along as well who are associated with one of the key contenders in, in the Haskell. Just tell us what you're going to be making tonight, Mark. Tonight we're doing a few different things. This is going to be an action-packed night for cocktails. We're going to be starting with a lemon drop martini, uh, which, as we'll talk about, I think is one of those cocktails that not everybody is going to say, that's my drink. But I'm going to try to convince you otherwise, show you that with fresh ingredients, even a drink like the lemon drop martini can be your new go-to. Uh, then we're going to be doing a fantastic classic, the whiskey smash, which is sort of a loose relative to the julep. Uh, we'll talk about Dale DeGroff, one of the legends of the bartending community, his tie to horse racing. And we're going to be doing, in, in celebration of some of the birthdays that have happened this past week, we're going to be doing a chocolate cake shot. There's absolutely nothing chocolate about it, but it tastes like chocolate cake. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to show you that. Plus maybe a science experiment or two. Nick. <laughs> oh, I, I like the sound of that. Mary Jane is a regular viewer. Mary Jane, good evening to you. Says must see TV every Thursday evening. Thank you very much. Carol's been on. I look forward to cocktails and conversation every week. Keeps getting better and better. Thank you, Mark, for all the awesome drink recipes and instructions. I never knew there's such a science to making awesome. a cocktail. I know I've been I've been educated, truly educated. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Um, Robert says my Saratoga streak has been broken. So many people who make it a pilgrimage every year to go to the spa sadly can't be there this time round. There has been some relaxation of regulation to let a few of the owners in, which is is great. But as we'll be hearing very shortly, pretty stringent as you'd imagine, the same as it is here in the UK. Uh, Carmen says, see you then. Bill Siegman's in town. Jeff Hall's in town as well. See you on the phone, but not Facebook Live. We're getting there, I think. Sue says, love and miss New York City Nation. Hi from uh, Doncaster, uh, Yorkshire, England. Uh, Hollis is in from Boston. And Susan as well. And Jeff and Deborah from New Jersey. So uh, who's off to Monmouth Park tomorrow for a pre-party authentic rah-rah. And we'll be talking to authentic owners very shortly. Awesome. Our viewers are just amazing. Even just, just listening to that, that list, I mean, it's, it's been incredible. The response on social media, so many of you have been sharing your cocktails with me. I think one week we're going to have to put your cocktail photos up there because in, in some cases they look better than mine. So, <laughs> so we I've may have a, to do that. I've got a very humble G&T tonight in my well, Breeders' Cup glass. You know, a G&T or a vodka and tonic has been my go-to tonight. So it's still a little warm in New York City, so I'm rocking a beer. But we've got plenty of cocktails to come, so no worries for that. Uh, Daily Doubles W is in Michigan. Dorian, wear a mask so we can all attend Breeders' Cup in person. Wear a Breeders' Cup mask, ideally. And so see all of us. There she is, Brittany Erton. <laughs> hey, Brittany. Uh, Made Brit it. And you look great as well. You don't look in it. You in no way do you look like a clown. So so thank you for for joining That's us. That's good. Uh, just to you know, let everybody know, I just flew in from California <laughs> to New Jersey, so I definitely look like I've been on a five and a half hour flight. Uh, background looks a little bit different, but hey, I managed to find myself some Chardonnay, so life is good. Where, <laughs> where are you? My next question. <laughs> I, I'm in the hotel room. <laughs> which I, I, I mean, I, I better not ask you which hotel you're in, just in case yeah, there's some crazy people around the corner who want to <laughs> find you. But it, it looks a significant. Uh, it looks an up switch from uh, the usual, the usual digs during Haskell week. They splurged. I've got my own kitchen. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> Some nice that. artwork as well. Uh, catch me up. How is everybody doing? Yeah. Mark? Oh, doing well. Really? That, that good? <laughs> doing that good? <laughs> doing well. We, we were saying that, uh, you know, I, I got my first haircut in five months, which was uh, a borderline religious experience. It, it was absolutely I'm awesome. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it's it's been a great Great week here, just uh, reconnecting with family. We've had some great birthday celebrations. I know your mom's birthday was on Monday, this past Monday. Yes, yes. Gosh, you have such a great memory. Yeah, it was uh, It was her birthday. It was nice and very low key. Um, okay. We did go to a restaurant outdoors, and okay. I think my dad had anxiety the entire time with the people walking around. So I don't see us going to a restaurant again anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Hall, good evening. Jeff, you guys have seriously helped all of us so much. Oh, Jeff, thank you so much. We've so enjoyed doing this. I did feel a bit wistful today, though, Brittany, when you posted on Instagram a photograph of us in the backyard at Saratoga, not quite a year ago, but probably 11 months ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be nice to be there now. Wouldn't it? I mean, it's mm -hmm. just I've been at Del Mar for a couple of weeks and it's 
absolutely not the same. I noticed the difference in the lack of fans more so there than any other track I've been to. And I'm not quite sure why. Perhaps it is because they're, these boutique meets, um, the fans really make it what it is, uh, both at Del Mar and Saratoga. But I, I mean, I know we all miss it. You know, at least we get to enjoy some great racing still, but it, it's not quite the same. I'm not picnicking back there. And I said, do you sing along with the piano at Ciro's? Just some uh, some good memories, but I can't last there longer than about a week. Mark, I don't know if you've been to Saratoga, but it um, it's draining to say the least. It takes takes it out of you a bit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I saw your post on Instagram. I saw Nick Luck there looking dapper as as always as well. But uh, hopefully in the future we can do it all three together. So we'll get there. Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. Mm -hmm. Kevin says, very sad to hear about Del Mar. Good luck to the jockeys. And, and most of the jockeys, Brittany, feeling fine, uh, happily. But, you know, yes. a lot of positive tests. So far, they're all, they all appear to be asymptomatic. So I hope that it stays that way. All of the jockeys that I know of that have tested positive haven't shown any symptoms. So that's good. Um, and it, it was the right move to cancel racing this weekend um, and to get everybody feeling healthy and well again. And what it could make for is just perhaps additional days of racing, bigger, stronger cards. So I think everybody's having to adjust um, to make sure that we are you know, putting forth a product in the safest environment that we can. And so we all have to be a little bit more understanding to all the changes this year, I think. Now, before we introduce the first of our very special guests, mm -hmm. and he is a, a man that you all know very well, I must just tell you about a special Maker's Mark bottle that has been released today for Breeders' Cup by these lovely people at Maker's Mark. I'm lucky enough to have one of these special edition uh, bottles, but there is an even more special edition coming out today, and that's in honor of James E. Ted Bassett III, who's long been regarded as the Thoroughbred Racing's gentleman ambassador, a decorated Marine. He was awarded the Purple Heart for his service during World War II. Wow. And he took the helm of Keeneland. We just had a new president of Keeneland announced, of course, but uh, Ted was the president of Keeneland from 69, and he oversaw the growth and expansion of the year-end championship event to new sites, including uh, Woodbine in Toronto, in Canada, and he's received exemplary honors from international racing organizations, the Eclipse Award of Merit, and was inducted into the National Amazing. Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame, of course, in Saratoga. A very, very special bottle, and just mm -hmm. 400 of these uh, or thereabouts are being made. If you can donate $400 to to us, to, to our charity, to the Museum and the Hall of Fame, Old Friends Farm, the Racetrack Chaplaincy of America's COVID-19 industry relief efforts, then you can have one of these bottles www.breederscup.com forward slash charity dash four dash champions make it happen with us here on cocktails and conversation and let's raise plenty of money for old friends for the hall of fame for the racetrack chaplaincy and the COVID 19 industry relief and we can all show our support together uh, in honor of a remarkable man Brittany. Yeah, truly remarkable, man. And these items, these bottles, they are stunning. They are collector's items. So it's going towards a good cause and you're getting something really beautiful and memorable in return. So I just saw that today. I just saw their post. I think it was just announced today. Um, so get involved with a very limited amount of bottles, 400, as you said. Oh, and I'm hearing it's tax deductible. It's always nice to hear. <laughs> Even better. Uh, I gather we're still having a, a few issues with the Facebook feed. Apologies if you're getting a, uh, a ropey feed tonight. You can head over to YouTube if you are and find us there as well. So I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of you can, can stay with us somehow. Shall we introduce our first guest? I think we shall because he'll have plenty of Saratoga stories as well. And it's been far too long since we've seen him. Here he is then. He only what? needs look. He doesn't even he, he doesn't even need a last name. Look at that, Stol Kumin. How are you, sir? I'm good. How you guys doing? Doing well. Where is awesome. so the first question? Where are you? Second question: What's the drink of choice? All right. Well, let's start with the drink of choice. That's the easy one. We got a little Tito's and soda. We didn't have any okay. fruit in the house, so I had to go no fruit. But it is uh, it's going down okay. Now I am in charge of an 11 year old tonight. I've got Corey, our good friend, mm -hmm. my daughter, here with me. We, uh, we had a couple of cross games today. We jumped in the car and drove to Saratoga. So we are wow. here overlooking Oklahoma. Um, and it is very strange being here. Uh, first time we've been here since last 
oh gosh, it's probably been Labor Day of last year. Um, so we wanted to come check out the house, make sure it was still here. And uh, we came down for, uh, for about you know, 24 hours. We're going to head back to Boston tomorrow. So I can see Oklahoma. I haven't seen a horse up close yet because we got in at about one today. But the hope is uh, tomorrow morning to, to poke out the, uh, the back door here and see, uh, see some horses up, up close. I, I was going to ask you, what's the deal with going and seeing the horses in the barns? Obviously, you're not allowed to, to the track unless you've gone through all the protocols and taken the COVID test and whatnot. What about, because I know one thing you absolutely love to do is to go around all the barns and see all the horses you've got bits and pieces on. Yeah, so I, I, they're still, I'm still working my way through the rules. Um, I think, unfortunately, if you have a spouse or children with you, you have no shot. So uh, I will not be leaving my 11-year-old. So I will, be, uh, I will be nowhere near the golf cart or the backside tomorrow, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that these rules will loosen up a little bit. That's what, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that's what Naira was hoping. Um, as of now, I think if you have a, rate, a horse in that day, um, a valid license, uh, owner's license, a recent negative COVID test, whatever it might be, you know, you're able to go to the backside in the morning. So I'll probably try to sneak back up here at some time uh, later on in the summer. But it definitely, it doesn't feel like Saratoga. It's good to be here. Um, you know, I'm watching the races that are, you know, a few football fields away. And, and it feels like I could be sitting in my uh, apartment in Boston. But it's, uh, I, I was dying to get up here and just, uh, just go to town and, and kind of be around. It's just a magical place up there. I spent most of my summers at Del Mar, but was introduced to Saratoga just, I don't know, in the past couple of years. Can you describe what normal Saratoga is like and why it's so special to people? Absolutely. I mean, it's really, the mornings are just, they're incredible. I mean, you know, it's nice and cool. You, you kind of head out to the track in the morning. Uh, the jockeys are there. Um, they're easily accessible. All the trainers are there. Um, everyone's friendly, you know, you get to watch your horses, uh, train in the morning, um, have a cup of coffee, you know, people are riding around in golf carts. It's just, a, there's just something about that morning. That's what got me hooked on the sport. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're missing it a little bit. Um, you know, the races are obviously, you know, tremendous in the afternoon here. The town's great. The people are welcoming. I mean, it's this, this, this whole town is, is set up for horse racing and, and really, um, you know, for me, I haven't seen a horse in person since the Breeders' Cup, so I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm dying to go to one of these back barns just to, uh, to feed somebody a peppermint tomorrow morning. It's been a long time. <laughs> and, and for those soul who who aren't familiar with just how how you got your intro to the game and and how you got your intro into into ownership, just just take us back a bit. Sure. Yeah. So I, I you know about probably five or six years ago now, I think it's probably almost six years. Um, I, I really didn't know anything about horse racing. I had a, a, a still have a good friend of mine, um, Jay Hanley, who uh, grew up close to Saratoga and approached me one day and said, look, I think you'll like the sport. There's a family element. There's a hang out and have a cocktail with your friends element. There's a deal element. The, the animals are amazing. Um, I, I just, I think you'd love it. So we bought a couple of horses uh, with Chad Brown. We ended up in the first batch uh, to have a horse called Lady Eli who was just a, you know, her once in a lifetime type filly and, and uh, you know, named her after my wife and took us on a journey, you know, won the grade one at two, three, four, and five, uh, won the Breeders' Cup as a two-year-old and, and just, that was it. I mean, that was my, you know, we got super lucky at the beginning um, and, uh, and it just kind of got hooked from there. I like how he just throws it in there. Oh, a horse named Lady Eli. I saw everybody knows her. She was a legend. Hey, uh, Lady Eli, just like that, <laughs> takes the lead on the inside of Sunset Bowl. <laughs> Civil Year is up to third on the inside, but it's Lady Eli into Rod Ortiz with a green run and a Breeders' Cup victory. Sunset Bowl was second, oh. Osama was oh. third. Rising. What do you remember about that day? That was day? a happy day. I, I, re I just remember jumping up and down, hugging all my friends, and we had about, you know, I think 60 people deep, and uh, it, was a, it was a special day. I mean, she, uh, she's a special horse. We've, had some, we've been super lucky to have some great horses, but that will always be my number one. You know, there'll be no, uh, no beating her for me. She had some trials and tribulations there. I mean, the, the bout with laminitis, that was very scary. I mean, what was that like for you and your family? It was hard. I mean, I think, you know, that was, that was really what got you you know, got me kind of hooked is, you know, you, you, you feel the, the sport has highs and lows. The highs are mm -hmm. about as high as they can get. And the lows are, you know, nights you can't sleep because you're so upset about a, a race. Or obviously in this case, much more, much more important than a race or health. And, um, you know, you, you, you know, really just 
got to understand, you know, her as a as a almost a person. I mean, you know, what she was going through, how tough she was. Um, you know, you went from wondering if you know she was going to live to wondering if she was going to come back. Then once it seemed like she was coming back, wondering if she was going to be able to race at a high level. Um, you know, making sure she wanted to do it because she'd already given you so much, and uh, you know, just going through the, the ups and downs of that was was uh, you know it was pretty intense. And um, and you know, I think that it's a, it was a kind of an education of what the sport can do to you, um, all in uh, all in one horse, the highs and the lows. And uh, and that was that was really it for me. I mean, I you know, I, I realized at that point that I wanted the sport to always be part of my life. And, um, you know, we, we've made it obviously a, you know, a bigger part of our life and it's been, uh, you know, it's been great for my family and my partners, my friends. We've had a, a lot of fun and some, uh, you know, some, some, some good luck along the way. What, what do you as a family get out of the sport? What, as a, I mean, for you, it's, you know, I've seen how passionate you are and you're sharing it with friends and you're so into the animals and so into the competition. What do you get out of it as a, as a, as a family? Well, my, my family loves it. I mean, my three kids, um, are, are borderline obsessed. I mean, you know, everything from, you know, what's running today, dad? Why is it, why is it with that trainer? Why are they running it on the turf? Why is this jockey on the horse? I mean, we, you know, we spend a lot of time at home over dinner, um, you know, that, talking about this stuff. And, you know, we have, we're going to talk about the Haskell horse here in a second, but, um, you know, Saturday is my youngest son, Sam's ninth birthday. And, you know, I, I wasn't, I've been to horse race, obviously, in a, you know, since the Breeders' Cup. Um, mm-hmm. And, so the whole the whole time he's been saying, "Look, my birthday's in July. I, I just want to go to a horse race. So we're gonna fly to the Haskell for the day, and it is, you know, for his birthday, just the two of us. And he is so excited. He can't stop talking about it. Obviously, some of the jockeys have changed. He knows who's riding what horse. I mean, he is, you know, and he's he's eight years old, about to turn nine. So you know, it, you know, I I didn't have any of that growing up, and um, you know, it's 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 fun to be able to enjoy it with them, right? They. They, you know, they go through the two-year-olds, they help name them, they help, you know, decide where they're going to, you know, where they're going to go. They ask a lot of questions. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's fun to, to do that with, with young kids. I mean, it's, uh, it's become a family affair. I mean, that's the future of the sport. It, it starts, you know, at a, a young age and they clearly have this love for it. I've seen plenty of horses named after your sons and daughter. I know that Uni, I believe, is one of their favorites. I, I've seen them get pretty passionate about uh, to the to the jockeys and, and the rides that they give and such. Um, how much enjoyment do you get out of seeing how much they love it? It's the best, right? It's, it's, it, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, it's, you know, we've got a, you know, a couple of partners that are super into it that we've, you know, it's great for our friendship and spending time together and my kids and, and their families all really love it. And that's what it's, that's what it's all about. I mean, we, you know, we had a Kentucky Derby horse a few years ago named my man, Sam, that was, you know, named after my son. It was like, you know, couldn't, you know, didn't win, but it was the greatest, you know, that day doing the walkover with my dad and my son. I mean, he was six years old or five years old and so happy. Um, you know, he's, he's got the stuff all over his wall. I mean, that's, they'll never forget that. We've got uh, a horse in an Indiana Tuesday named Corey uh, mm-hmm. with Brad Cox. We think it's going to be pretty tough. Um, a filly that, uh, that he likes a lot. So, we, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, we've, I've got a, a day job and, and, um, you know, lots of responsibilities like everyone does. And, um, you know, for me, this is sort of a, something that we're able to do, um, kind of on the side and, uh, and it's, it's just brought my family and friends and partners a ton of joy. And that's, um, you know, we're super fortunate to have found at this point in our lives. We're, we're going to, um, talk to, to Jack and Laurie, who, who you've had quite a few horses in partnership with in, in a little while as well, but, um, just what's the attraction for you, Sol, of being sometimes just a small part of a, of a big high profile horse rather than being the whole part of a, of a horse? Yeah, I don't really, you know, get too worked up about how much of the horse I own. I mean, you know, I think we average owning about, I think last year was 38% of of a horse. That was, you know, the average ownership for our group. So just about 40%. So sometimes we own half, sometimes we own two thirds, sometimes we own all, sometimes we own 20%. Um, I think one of the things that's helped us, um, you know, have some success is just being able to be flexible with that, right? Um you know, if there's a horse that we like that we're trying to buy into and, you know, not everybody will take 20% or 25%. Um, some people want to have their silks all the time. For us, you know, maybe we'll give that up, right? So we're just trying to, you know, to, to be get involved with the best horses we can and do the, you know, s- smartest kind of financial transactions with the horses that we can. And, and um, 
you know, we try to be flexible. And I think it's it's helped put us in some, you know, some good situations. I mean, it doesn't feel, you know, less good to own a third of Uni than it does to own 50% of Modern Boy Girl and to own what it, it doesn't, you know, I don't get less joy. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you want to own enough that, you know, it matters, you know, to, to you. And But it, the, the difference between 30 and 35 and 40 and 20, I mean, I, I don't care. I mean, you know, I just, I want to own good horses and have some fun. It's about the thrill of it as well. Now, with your job, you understand risk and value and how to assess that. You have had a lot of success in this game, and you'll be humble about it. But for you, how much of it is luck in this game, and how much of it is it surrounding yourself with a really good team? I think it's all of it, right? I mean, I think look, the first thing is um, you know you've you've, you've got to have a good team around you that you can trust and. And we've got that with Brad Weisford and, and Liz Crow and, and their team. Um, they work extremely hard for us. We have um, you know some other agents that that buy us horses, especially outside the U.S. A really nice job for us. Um, you know we've we've got a great group of trainers that are kind of our core trainers that we use. Um, you know we try to look at things a little bit differently. We use a lot of data, um, and you know we need to get lucky, right? I mean the, that's the, the reality, right? I mean horses they're not cars. They get hurt. Um, you know, you go through ups and downs, you have to manage them the right way. Um, we try to give them time when they're hurt. We give them time between horses, I mean, between races. We just try to, you know, try to manage our stable the, the best that we can. And, um, and we've, you know, we've been ex obviously extremely lucky. I mean, you know, the, the luck element is not lost on us, right? I mean, we, we, we know we've been lucky um, and we're just hoping that that will continue a little bit longer, maybe through Saturday at least. <laughs> let's um let's talk a little bit about saturday there's every possibility that you and Brittany will be uh speaking in the winner's enclosure because authentic still remains a pretty promising pretty promising cult even after defeat last time yeah i, I think he's going to be tough in here i mean look you, you know you gotta hopefully hopefully ship well and, and hopefully he'll break um but if those two things happen uh, listen i think he's going to be competitive in there um it's a you know Bob had said months ago, even you know, before he had won, even the, the grade three won, he said that I see this as a Haskell horse. And, you know, you can look at, at Bob's success in this race. It's obviously off the charts. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, the, the horse just seems to fit, you know, this type of track with his running style. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I mean, you know, we got to get lucky from here. Um, but I think it's a good spot where, you know, we should be the favorite, I think, at race time. Um, you know, we won this race once before with Exaggerator. Um, it is, ironically, my favorite trophy that I have in my trophy case. So, um, Do you have it with you in Saratoga? Can we see it? It's in my <laughs> box. And has, uh, where I'd bring it out. But it's a very cool trophy. It's got these flags coming out. It's, it happens to be my favorite one. So, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, we, we hope at this point we just got to get lucky. You seem so calm. Do you ever get nervous before a race? Um, maybe just right before for a couple of minutes, you know. Um, but I can't control it. I mean, you know, it's not, you, you know. I get nervous before I have to give a presentation because I, you know, I can screw it up. But, um, you know, at this point, yeah, I just need to show up and, and make sure that I don't lose my nine year old and I get back on the plane. If I do that, then it can't be a bad day. Um, so, no, I, I don't get too nervous. I mean, look, I, I get anxious. Um, you know, you want to, to have a chance to run. I mean, the, the races that are disappointing um, are just when, you know, you just don't get a chance. You know, you don't get a chance to execute. Right. Sometimes jockey gets it rings in the Delmar Futurity. Correct. Correct. It, you know, it happens. And if that happens, it happens. I mean, it's, it's part of the game. Sometimes it works for you and sometimes it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. But as long as you get a chance, you know, you, we get beat, uh, whatever it is, 75% of the time, right? So, you know, if we're winning at 25%, we're having a good year. So you get used to losing. We lose all the time. Um, and uh, and you've you got to become a good loser or, uh, or, or you're not going to be able to last very long in this game. Uh, but but look, it, it, it's exciting, right? This are it's about the big races and the, the big horses, and um, you know, just to have one that's going to be going to be live on a big stage like this is exciting. Ain't that you, the truth? You, oh, amazing! Yeah, I mean, you got to get used to losing. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I I wanted to talk a little bit about last weekend and Monomoy Girl because yep. we missed her. We missed her last year, and and Midnight Bizu kind of took over the baton, if you like, and then she suddenly became the most popular filly in the U.S. Now you're back in the game. Are the two of them going to meet? And are they, when are they going to meet? Oh, yeah. I mean, I missed her, too. I probably missed her more than you, Nick. I mean, I really missed her. Um, she, uh, you know, it's good to have her back. I mean, I, you know, I, we'll see. You know, Midnight Bizu has gotten better, and uh, and I think Monomoy Girl has gotten better also. Um, <laughs> 
I, I we're gonna have to we're gonna have to see that they, they will run against each other. I mean, they're both headed to the same Breeders' Cup race as of now. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure they'll race each other in the next race. I mean, Beast who's gonna go to the Phipps, uh, or sorry, the uh, the personal ensign here in Saratoga. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think Monomoy Girl at this point will probably go to the race on Derby Day, um, you know, the great one. I can't think of what it's called. Um, and then, you know, they could they could meet each other in the prep after that before the Breeders' Cup or, you know, go to separate preps and and, uh, and run in the Breeders' Cup. So, you know, we'll see. I'm always you know, a little bit conflicted, um, you know, being involved with both. Um, you know, they're both, again, two unbelievable fillies, two great trainers, great partners in uh you know, in, in both horses, I mean, just awesome ownership groups. And, um, you know, it's, uh, by the way, we should give uh, Florent a happy birthday today as we're talking mm. about one girl. Ah! Please, please. So happy birthday, Flo. I know you're home with uh, with Corona and you're feeling good. Like Brittany said, I, I, I know you're feeling pretty good. So we miss you and, uh, and thank you for last weekend. We've got Cheers. so many yeah, birthdays. It's gonna be part. it's gonna be very fitting because we have so many birthdays to celebrate with a particular drink a little bit later. But but we'll tease oh, that. Cool. Um, I just yeah. I, I wanted to ask Saul quickly for you, Midnight Bee Zoo and and, and Monomoy Girl. Is this like as if Sam and Jack were going up against each other in a lacrosse tournament? I mean, your two children going <laughs> off against each other. Yeah, it, it feels a little bit like that, right? I mean, the only time it was really awkward for me, honestly, was at the was at the Cotillion a couple of years ago when, um, you know, they you had the, the DQ. so yeah, I was there with one of my kids, and you know, I had two different groups of partners, and I didn't know where to stand, and um, you know, my son sort of looked at me and said, "Dad, what's happening?" And I kind of looked at him and said, "Just just be quiet and stand here. We're gonna take a picture in a minute, either way. I don't know which way it's gonna work." But uh, if it goes this way, we're going to shy away from this group. And if it goes this way, we'll, we'll shy away from the other group. It was it was probably the only time it's been uncomfortable. Um, but, uh, you know, the, every, both groups get it. Um, both trainers get it. I mean, you know, they're they're two spectacular horses. And uh, I just hope, honestly, they both uh, they both stay sound. They both keep getting better. And, uh, you know, and everybody gets to see them run against each other, including me. I mean, there's no, 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 we're not, no one's, I don't think either one of them is trying to duck the other one. They've just been on. A little bit different schedules. I think you know there was a shot. Mom, my girl was going to go into the um, to the. Uh, well, I guess it was the Lord Lee. Against her. Uh, no, I think she was going to run in the Phipps, but it was just a little a little close back. So, either way, you know it'll happen. Hopefully, but you know before between now and the Breeders' Cup, and maybe it'll be the Breeders' Cup showdown, which would be amazing. Like Songbird and Beholder, maybe we'll get the another rendition of something like that. That would be pretty epic. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. But there's some other good horses in that division. I mean. Dunbar Road is is a really good horse, and Kawana. I'm not sure. I mean, there's some there's some really really nice horses. You know, she's a Julie, so so it'll be you know it's gonna be really interesting. Well, let's drink to a potential clash imminently yeah. between Monomoy Girl and we Midnight Bee Zoo, and we'll we'll get a camera right on Sol as they come down to the wire. Um, Mark Tuberty, you've got everything for us tonight. You've got <laughs> drinks that sound good, but you've got a bit of science as well. I do. I have a bit of a science experiment going on here. So, you know, it occurred to me when we were thinking of the potential cocktails for tonight. Yes, we're going to be doing an awesome birthday related shot, which is a chocolate cake shot. And my way of making it is with citron vodka, hazelnut liqueur, and then you bite on a lemon with sugar. Now, obviously, we're working. We love Tito's. We're using Tito's and Tito's doesn't have that lemon flavor built into it. So it got me thinking maybe we can talk a little bit about how we infuse those flavors into our favorite spirits. And one of the easiest ways, I mean, citron vodka or lemon peel vodka is as easy as peeling your lemons, combining it with vodka and leaving it in a mason jar for a couple of days. But this is a one hour program. So I had to speed things up. So I've got a little bit of a science experiment for you you're, guys. You're lucky, you're lucky if it's a one hour program, if you're a regular viewer. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, it hasn't been a one hour program now. since about week two. I Sometimes maybe I could get away with a traditional infusion, but... <laughs> So what we're going to be doing today, I'm actually making some lemon peel infused vodka during the course of this show. And the way we're doing that, and I don't recommend doing this at home, do it with a mason jar, but I'm using an ISI container. So this is basically a whipped cream container and I'm charging it with nitrogen. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a high pressure environment inside of this container. And it's going to actually take down that infusion time to about 30 minutes. So I've already hit it with one charge of nitrogen. I saved the second one for you guys. So I'm going to screw this in. You're going to hear a little bit of a hiss. Maybe. Mm-hmm. So now that's got about 30 minutes. That's going to be ready for our shot at the end of the program. Again, if you want to do your own lemon peel vodka or something like that at home, 
just make sure you rinse and wash your lemons or all of your produce thoroughly. Because a lot of times they have that wax on the outside, um, you know, sort of uh, other chemicals and stuff. You want to make sure you clean it thoroughly, then peel it, combine it with your spirit in a mason jar. Make sure it's in a cool, dark place and taste it regularly about once every two or three days to see where the flavor is at before you start taking out the botanical. So that's just for our citron vodka, but we are talking first and foremost about the lemon drop martini today. I know Mark, it might be a astronaut. little, what's that? You're an astronaut, says <laughs> Kenny Flannery. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I know Kenny Flannery and he's a bit of an astronaut himself, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna be starting with the lemon drop martini. Now I know this is one of those polarizing drinks because when I say lemon drop, not everybody's gonna be like, oh yeah, I'll order that at the bar. It sounds a little fruity. It may sound a little overly sweet to people. But again, we're learning about the basics of cocktails. When you're using fresh ingredients and you have it in the right proportion, the right balance, almost any drink can be a delicious drink. And the lemon drop martini is no exception. Best way to think about it is like spiked lemonade. So nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But you can also think about it, dare I say, as a vodka cousin to the sidecar. We still have that sugar rim. We still have uh, an orange liqueur, a citrus element, and a base spirit. So when you think about it like that, it's not just this fruity drink, it's a delicious cocktail. Now the drink itself was created by Norman J. Hobday. He was the owner of a bar called Henry's, uh, Henry Africa's. This was in San Francisco back in the 1970s. And it's interesting, that bar was one of the first uh, fern bars. I didn't really know about this, but I guess it's like TGI Fridays, the original TGI Fridays, converting that kind of dark and gloomy bar atmosphere into mm. something with a little bit more flair to it. So anyway, the drink took off after the 1970s, spread across the world, and of course, it is one of the most popular drinks today. So let's talk about what we're gonna need. Of course, our Tito's handmade vodka. Mm -hmm. We are gonna need some triple sec, so I'll be using Cointreau. I brand. didn't bring my bar cart with me, I'm sorry. Didn't make I the know trip. You, you may have to raid that mini bar. I don't know if they stopped you up there, but I'm, I'm impressed that you got the starting name. I know you were running, so you, you did well. <laughs> I was, I had to make a pit stop. <laughs> I don't blame you for a second. I would have done the same thing. Uh, we are going to need some fresh lemon juice, guys, and simple syrup as well. Again, we use it all the time. If there's one ingredient you can learn how to make at home, equal parts sugar and water, it will do you a world of good, um, not necessarily nutritionally, but you can make a lot of cocktails with it. Now, one of the characteristic defining parts of a lemon drop is that sugar rim. So I'm going to show you how to do that tonight. You are going to need a plate with some super fine sugar. So just a regular kind of like, I guess, salad plate like that works fine. And then we're also going to need a lemon wedge. And the thing with that is you want a little slice crosswise down the middle. And that's so we can put it on the rim, rub it around, and then do our rim. So we're going to do that a little bit later on. But let's go ahead and start by adding one ounce of lemon juice into our cocktail tin. All right. I don't know if anybody is uh, following along at home. We've had some great participation. As I said earlier, some of your cocktails that you show me on social media look better than mine. You guys are doing a fantastic job, uh, either learning fast or maybe you just know a lot more um, than, I, than I estimate sometimes, but I'm proud of you nonetheless. All right, we are gonna do three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. So we're balancing out that acid with our sweetness. Now right there, if you are not the type of person that typically likes a lemon drop, take a look at what we did. We have two fresh ingredients, so we've got fresh lemon juice and homemade simple syrup. Just by doing that, you're increasing the quality of this cocktail probably 200 fold. I know it can be tempting sometimes to buy those pre-made sour mixes that you see at the grocery store. They're convenient, but they're loaded with artificial flavoring and preservatives, and they just don't deliver that same burst of fresh flavor. So if you're starting with fresh lemon juice and simple syrup, you're paving the way towards a delicious cocktail. And you get a headache when you use those mixed yeah. little drinks. You know, uh, so my wife, Jasmine, is actually uh, gluten intolerant. And one thing that I found out from a customer is that in some of those pre-made sour mixes, there are actually things that contain gluten. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you have this gluten intolerance and you found that if you order a margarita or a whiskey sour at a bar and they're not using those fresh juices, that could be one of the reasons why. And that blew my mind when I, when I found that out. So it really speaks to the fact that just like food, you want to know what's going into your drink the mm -hmm. same way that you want to know what's going on the plate. If you're making it from scratch, you know exactly what the ingredients are, and that's that's what makes it so delicious. So Sorry, now we're gonna... <laughs> he's enjoying his keto soda. That's a good he's call. So, he's so serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are going to do a half ounce of our Cointreau. Now you may have noticed that with our simple syrup, we only did three quarters of an ounce. 
whereas we did an ounce of the lemon juice, so a little bit less. And that's because I knew that we were going to have this liqueur in there, which is also sweet. So it's always something to keep in mind when you're balancing the sweetness and, and acidity of cocktails. Think about all the ingredients you're adding and then make sure you keep that in balance. So finally, we're going to add two ounces of Tito's handmade vodka. And as soon as we do that, before we add ice to our cocktail shaker, we're going to go ahead and start rimming our cocktail glass. So again, sort of thinking ahead here, we don't want to shake our cocktail. It's all nice and cold. It's sitting on the ice and then we rim the glass. We want to make sure we do that first so that as soon as this cocktail is done, it can go directly into the glass and to your guests, or in this case, I guess me. But uh, so let's go ahead and we're going to take our martini glass, which has been pre-chilling, dump out the ice. And now if you have something like that, like ice that you're chilling your, your martini glass, I would recommend go ahead and dry that off quickly because when you're doing a sugar rim, you don't want that excess moisture around. That's going to make for a messy rim and you don't want that. <laughs> messy. <laughs> Am I missing something? <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, let's sorry, <laughs> stop it, Nick. All right, let's go ahead. We're going to take that lemon wedge put it on the side of the glass and work our way all the way around, okay? As soon as we've done that, while the lemon juice is still fresh there, we're gonna just dip it gently into our sugar and swirl around here. Now I know some people may be inclined to skip this step, but it adds a really nice textural element, just like with the sidecar. So you can see it's a very fine rim. That's not so much to make it overly sweet, but it's gonna add that textural element and really make for a, a beautiful lemon drop. So now you guys are still laughing. I know I'm missing something. It's all good. <laughs> no, it's Nick, I can't. <laughs> it's like off his eyes. Please, I can't stop laughing. Do not blame me. Do not blame me. <laughs> all right. Mark, I'm in awe of I'm in awe of your talents. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Part of my talents is just keeping a straight face, I guess, when I say something silly. <laughs> Bill Zygmunt says, what's so funny, Nick? Exactly, Bill. It's time to grow up. <laughs> oh. All right. So we've added our ice to our glass. We're going to give this a nice shake. Do we have stats? I mean, you would not be able to read all of Saul's winners. There's too no. many. No, oh. no, no, no. Hold the phone, Mark. This, this is a little no, thing I that we do, it. Saul. No. This no, is the only way that I get a workout is that Nick reads the stats you while I you, shake for like you three minutes. You, you crack on, Mark. Okay. Normally, it's probably fine. Okay, go. Yeah, Breeders' Cup, Juvenile, 2014, Diamond Jubilee Stakes, Preakness Stakes, Kentucky Derby, Preakness Stakes, Belmont Stakes, Kentucky Oaks, Travis Stakes, Breeders' Cup, Juvenile, Phillies, Breeders' Cup, Mile, with Just by Modern Boy Girl, Lady Eli, Exaggerated, Mind Your Biscuits, and British Idiom. That kind of does it, doesn't it? All right. Nick spared me this week. So that went on for like three minutes one time. <laughs> I was freezing with, at the end with of Todd it. Fletcher. Um, I feel like <laughs> Chad Brown would approve of this cocktail. Saul, I don't know if you saw the episode that Chad was on, but he went through three mango martinis. It was oh, quite yeah. the, yeah, fruity likes, drink. A fruity, he likes a fruity cocktail. He's a flavored vodka guy. <laughs> <laughs> so this, yeah, this would definitely be a Chad Brown favorite, I think. Mm. All right, so that is our lemon drop martini. I ask you, put your preconceptions aside. I know it's not for everyone, but give this recipe a try. I guarantee you'll like it. Cheers, guys. Enjoy. Look at that. Cheers. That and looks look at that. That's a perfect sugary rim as well, Mark. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank Super. You, <laughs> and we will be back with Mark very shortly, but we're going to welcome in our next guest because it's not only Mark Tuberty who makes a cocktail on this show, Brittany. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not. Lori and Jack Wolf for joining us as well, who I hear are going to be making cocktails along with us a little bit later. But I love having both of you on with us as part owners of Authentic, but also two of three of the Avengers. Jack, where did that even come from, from Bob Baffert? The Avengers and Starlight Racing, Madike and SF Racing. <clears throat> Saul, you're going to have to help me here. <laughs> uh, I think it all started with Tom Ryan and then uh, Bafford picked up on it and uh, you picked up on it, Brittany, and you, you got me. Roll with it. You, you got me as, uh, who was I? Thor. 
Thor. Yeah, Thor. No, Thor. Thor. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thor. <laughs> I'm, I'm are, you, are you okay? Are you okay with being that Avenger? I feel like it's very fitting for you, John. I think it's perfect. <laughs> so we said you were Iron Man. I like that. I like that. I've been yeah. working out a lot. Of I'm feeling pretty good about that. And then Tom <laughs> could be Captain America. I felt like that was fitting. Well, I think that's what Bob dubbed me. Uh, I think we were going to try and make Bob take that title, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's in the right position. But but jokes aside, how how did this partnership come to be? Um, you know, from my standpoint, and and Saul may have had a different experience, but uh, um, you know, Tom reached out to to me, and he came up with the idea of, of trying to, you know, raise some capital to get the, the super bloodstock agents together and, and, and give the horses to, to Bob. And um, so, you know, I said, I'm all in. And, you know, we had Frankie Brothers as our bloodstock agent. And, of course, Donato was there. And, and then Henry Field was there. And, um, and then I'm sure he reached out to Saul. And, you know, Bradley Weisborg had some, some people involved. And, uh, so we just, I mean, just sort of threw it together and uh, went out there and searched for some good yearlings. And um, I mean, his first crop has been unbelievable, as we all see, you know. But uh, it just came about. When you say so, I mean, that's pretty much how it happened. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we, you know, yeah. once we heard, you know, who that who the team was and who the partners were, it was a pretty easy decision. Um, you know, from from our end, we we don't have to do much. Um, so they they take care of everything. Um, you know, Tom Ryan's done an un unbelievable job managing the horses, uh, managing the the buying team, the budgets, the you know the whole thing, the getting the stallion deals done. Um, you know, so we're I, I just look at, at at us being really lucky to uh, to be along for the ride, and it's been you know it's been a lot of fun. I feel like we've seen this evolution of ownership from sole owners to now really plenty of partnerships. How much more fun is it to enjoy these big victories with, with other people? Lori, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lori you I love it. I do. The more people we have that it's, uh, we can share these big moments with, it's outstanding. I mean, you have people that have a shared passion and you, you are lucky enough, as we all know, to win these big races, how hard it is. And then you're around a group of people like this. It's amazing. It's, an, it's a no-brainer. And, you know, you look at the bills every month. It's yeah, I agree. It's awesome. I mean, it really, it's, it's just not that much fun. I mean, you look at the bills every month and you're paying 25% of the bills instead of 100%, or, you know, 30%, or 30 or 30% or whatever. And, whatever it is. um, from an economic standpoint, this is a business with that, as we all know, have a you know has a high risk of a degree of risk, and to to share that risk, uh, I think it's pretty cool economically. I'm still on the other side. I'm like, yes, let's bring like minds together <laughs> and celebrate. <laughs> I know. I, COVID has, has put quite the damper on everybody celebrating together, has it not, Nick? Well, I, I, I mean, okay. it has, but at least at least the sport's still still just about going. And and I think, um, Laurie, Jack, you, you'll agree that it's it's hard times for us all. But it, for, for us in horse racing, we've we've held together better than than a lot of people have been able to in a lot of sports and a lot of walks of life. Yeah, Nick, I think the uh, the greatest thing about when all this started, you know, we have to race these horses. They can't be in their stalls, you know, and regardless of the inconvenience to the owners of not being able to be there and all that is really insignificant. It's great that, that our industry has gone ahead and, and the racetracks have allowed it to race, obviously, restrictions. So from that standpoint, and we're better off than you know, the NBA, the NFL, and actually mm. NCAA, you know, sports too. So I think that's Definitely. the important thing. I like this. I, I wanted, yeah. I, I, yeah Life, good. Perfect point. Life's highs and lows are always better with friends and family, and that can't be more true. So we have kept you for long enough. We will now bug Lori and Jack with all the questions, but I will see you at Mammoth yeah. Park 
on Saturday. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, bye the next time, Saul. See you tomorrow. Good to see you. Oh, Saul, Saul Cumin, and, and good luck. Good luck to him and good luck to you guys Saturday. I wanted to ask you, um, Jack and Laurie, a little bit about the TAA, the Thoroughbred After Care Alliance, because it's a, a, a project I know that you helped to, to establish and is, is very dear to your to your hearts. And and just wanted to know from your standpoint how how it's progressing now and how it's how it's been getting on during during the last few months. Well, I think you know, like all of uh, all of these aftercare things, the um, you know donations and you know the contributions and and whatever is slowed down. But uh, I think one of the good things we did when we started this thoroughbred aftercare alliance was we had some really good people that had very good business minds, me not included, <laughs> but that, that would, uh, we decide to put a, a good amount of the, the funds raised in reserve just for, uh, you know, situations like this. So um, I think from that standpoint, um, we're doing, you know, doing okay. And they probably wouldn't like me to say we're doing okay because we, we want to raise more funds, but, uh, it was a um, boy. It was a crazy thing to put together, and uh, I'm glad we spent the time and did it. And so here we are. Because they have accredited so many wonderful organizations. I know you both are longtime supporters of New Vocations, which is a wonderful um, facility. They have multiple facilities, um, but the one that I, I've been to in Kentucky is just remarkable, headed by Anna Ford. And she told me not too long ago that they actually had empty stalls for the first time. So it was really wonderful to see these horses being adopted as they rehab, retrain, and rehome these horses. Do you two feel that it's the responsibility of an owner to give back to these horses once they're retired? I think, in my opinion, I think it's the responsibility of the entire industry. So it's not just the owners. I mean, we keep track of all of ours once they leave. And, but I mean, if you've bred one, if you have consigned one, I, I think it's your responsibility. I mean, it's um, it's a family out there, and these are our babies that we're sending out, and we want to make sure they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Nick, I know this is a horse racing show, and we got to talk about authentic, but I kind of want to know how Lori and Jack even met. We haven't had a couple on the show, have we? <laughs> Have we not? We, uh, do you know what we haven't? We've had we've had so many parents and children. Yeah. Fathers yeah. And daughters. You know, Brittany, thank, thanks for asking that because I, I think this might be an X-rated show because I heard something about a messy rim and wash your lemons from Mark. So, um, maybe we can, maybe honestly, we can. how old are we? Nick and I could not stop laughing. Oh, <laughs> uh. Mark T. I mean, seriously, he was just like. Yeah. He's the straight man. <laughs> he kept oh, a straight face. Oh, oh, He's a great straight man. Uh, we uh, we met when we were both in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, Jack uh, was running his hedge fund then, and I worked in the same building, and there had to, something ha there was something about a police report, but uh, nothing to do with us. So we'll just kind of leave it like hanging out there. We've been together now twenty five years. Yeah, please can't. I love that. Did either of you have a passion for horses at that time? Yeah, Jack. Well, can I speak for you? Yeah. So Jack's grandfather brought him out to Miles Park. I mean, he's been going since he was a baby in Kentucky. And I'm from Louisiana. And so um, I didn't discover the horses. We had quarter horse tracks were the, the closest ones to where I lived. So I didn't really discover them till later, but my grandparents had a very small farm and we were telling a story last night of a Shetland pony I had that um, would drag me around a hurricane fence. And my dad's like, pick your leg up and swing it over the other side. He won't scratch his belly much more if you keep doing that. So um, we met as a shared passion about the horses and I uh, got to enjoy quite a few tracks you know, traveling around before we ever purchased any. So. Yeah, I think our first um, trip to Saratoga was uh, when Eleanor uh, was, or Laurie was in full with Eleanor, yeah. who's now 22. So uh, 
Uh, oh, that was a great story. So uh, Jack's like, you know, it's Travers weekend. Let's go up to Saratoga. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome. And I'm like, as we're flying up, we land. I'm like, where are we staying? He goes, oh, we'll get a hotel. We'll get a hotel. Mm -hmm. We literally have a fucking closet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I think you can cuss on the show, right? <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. We've, it's amazing. It's taken us 14 weeks to get an F in. This is true. <laughs> so we have a closet with a twin bed and I am pregnant with Eleanor and literally you can't open the door to the bathroom unless somebody moves out of the way. And I'm like, oh, this is nice. But we got in and um... they felt bad for me. We got upgraded the next day. Gideon Putnam. They were solid. Oh, that's so we decided to to get in the horse business in 2000 and we were buying yearlings um, and our first crop, we um, we had Harlan's holiday, which helped take care of a lot of the bad horses we bought, so. But it's a bit like Sol was saying, you know, the first horse he gets involved with, yeah, he's got, you know, like you, he, he went in with with means, but the first horse he drops on is Lady Eli, who's a who becomes a cult hero. Yes. And the first horse, the first horse you're involved with is Harlan's Holiday, who may not have been a cult hero, but was a household name. Right. Uh, it's uh, and that's got you then. You're you that if you even want to go into reverse gear, you've got no choice. You can't. Well, and, then we get a shadow. Two thousand. Yeah. yeah. Two years later. Two thousand two thousand four Breeders' Cup winner. Yeah. Oh so how, how was how was how was that first Breeders' Cup win? Oh, that was amazing. That was amazing. Well, my you know my reaction. Um, our first Breeders' Cup horse was Harlan's Holiday, and he sort of ran up not sort of he ran up the track in Chicago, and um, and I I just got to oh. you know have horses with uh, Todd. What do we have here? A shot. A shot. All right, let's talk about a shot. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable move that Johnny put and to, to squeeze those horses out. You know, Craig, uh, Craig Burnick's a friend of mine, and we just mauled his horse at the head of the stretch, you know. And and Johnny just gave him a great ride sure. and her a great ride <laughs> in Todd's first Breeders' Cup. And then he won with Spites Town a few races later. So, and, and you know, the year before it was pretty cool out in Santa Anita uh, as, a, as a two year old and Julie Crone had the, the, the half best bridled, ride half, half bridled that she rode that horse unbelievably from the 14 hole. And, um, and then, you know, the third time she ran, she, I think she ran third, something like that, but what a great race mare, obviously. Yeah. You know. Really special, really so special. And I remember who your, your other, um, uh, Breeders' Cup winner, um, which was just recently, 2012, wasn't it? Um, Shanghai yeah. Bobby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we were that stretch run, though. I mean, all hard. You know, we go ahead. We were talking. You know, we with, were just sharing Peter the story, it, you know. and then we're looking for the actual photographs because we were sent. Breeders' Cup put out three photos. Yeah, you can see it right here. Yeah. And it's of our group where we were, and everybody's like this. And then it, it immediately goes like, and then the announcer goes, and Shanghai Bobby is finished. And then we're like, ah. and then so we come we're, back to yeah, it. Yeah, we're past here, you know. But I, I will say this. Rosie gave him, he, she knew that horse like nobody's business. And she was just like, he gets out on the lead so easy. And he's like, wait a minute. I want people to play with. I want to run with somebody. And so she's like, no, 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 no. And then he finally re-engages. I mean, to listen to Rosie after that race talking about riding that horse, she's like, she's like, I had the best horse. I had so much horse. But he in his mind's like, I don't want to run by myself. I don't want to hang out. So right Nick, there. Nick, how was the interview in the winter circle? Oh, yeah. Uh, one of one of my favorites. <laughs> 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 I don't wait, is everyone, there a story that I don't know about this? I don't know. Every everyone loves those in winner circle interviews, don't they, Brittany? Oh yeah! Everybody fights for them. Everybody in the everyone loves it. Like, oh, I want to do those. And lately, it's been Nick and I that have had to do the winner's circle interviews. I always feel like I never know what to ask because everybody's already been interviewed at that point in time. Well, Nick asked me a couple of questions, and 
NBC cut away from him real quick to get me out of the picture. Jack so, was <laughs> cuddling but, about the Grey Goose. Oh, no. Matters. We can't say Grey okay, Goose. Okay, right? uh, the other vodka, <laughs> yeah. the other vodka cradling, and he was just like, hey. Don't don't take it personally, honestly. The the less time they can spend on those things, the better. Right. And everyone gets kind of everyone gets screamed at, marshaled into thing. The owners don't know what they're doing. The, the lights suddenly come on. They go to you. They noise everywhere, and then they kind of uh, it all looks quite serene on TV. But you, having experience, know that it's anything but when you're actually in the middle of it. No, I, think it was, I think it was a great move for everybody concerned. <laughs> <laughs> But it's got to be, I, I love hearing from owners talking about their horses coming down the stretch and the roller coaster of emotions that you go through. Is there one race in particular that just really stands out that either got your heart racing or you didn't think he was going to get there or she was going to get there? Is there anything that stands out to you guys? I would say for me, the latest one, I mean, after we just talked about Bobby, um, the latest one was um, Justify and the Preakness. Yeah, you go in and you the fog descends right before the race. Mm -hmm. And Larry's back there calling, going, I'm guessing everybody's kind of in the same position, basically. And when he breaks through the fog, and you just seem, I mean, it was amazing. That was one that's just always like here. And I have to say that um, the picture the next morning, I was flying down to meet my sister. And when I have both of our kids on the back, I'm a New York post kind of gal and when i've got both of the kids on the back of the new york post with justify and i'm like so <laughs> that was pretty good i, I would um, say for me it would it would be shanghai bobby i mean he was undefeated yeah. two-year-old going yeah. into that thing you might want to let him and that was bar. um when the you know the new jersey monsoon and all that stuff came up and he shipped out late and and actually there was some talk about changing riders and I stood behind Rosie and uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Mm. Very special. I, I just wanted to go back to justify uh, briefly because I don't suppose any owner when they get into the game really believes that they're going to own part of a, of a triple crown winner, even if it's what you uh, aspire to. Do you think, do you think people would, would have taken him more to their hearts had it not been for Pharaoh three years earlier, and and that we if we'd had to ha if we'd had to wait for from um, seventy eight to to two thousand and eighteen, for example, for the for the Triple Crown winner, do you think people would think about him differently now? Absolutely, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah. he's he stands on his own, and I, and it's and so does Pharaoh. I mean, listen, they're both fantastic horses. And, but I think just coming so quickly after Pharaoh, I mean, Justify just seems, mm, okay, we just did that a little bit. But listen, five races, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, we did not purchase into him until after he broke his maiden. Mm. So, as we all know, you can break your maiden, you may not ever have another win. And then he goes on that roll, and it, it's, um, I mean, he he's just a superstar, a yeah, superstar. Nick, I'm, I'm, I get where you're coming from there. And and maybe the, you know, and everybody was wanting to change the rules before American Pharaoh came in, this and that. And maybe it cheapens uh, the second Triple Crown so closely. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't really buy yeah. it. Uh, I, and I and here's, here's the deal, Jack, you know, uh, it, it could be another 30 years before we have another one. Right, right, exactly. And I don't. In the seventies, there were three. A firm triple crown shouldn't be cheapened because he was the third of three. You know, I, I think maybe because it's been it's so recent. It was only two years ago. Two years ago um, that he won the triple crown. I bet you in another ten years we're going to say it's too tough again. The industry likes to do that, do we not? <laughs> yes, we do. And, and you know, Bob. I mean, it, this wasn't you know. This was no cakewalk, you know. Bob managed this horse perfectly, and I, I know, you know, Joe Drake talks about the positive and all this stuff in the Santa Anita Derby, which has nothing to do with it. But uh, the way that he and Jimmy Barnes managed this horse was unbelievable, and he won all the races. He 
clear, you know, clean the board. And I mean, I personally think it's it's more of an accomplishment than American Pharaoh. I'm not sure Bob agrees with me. I think I think he's never said this, but I think American Pharaoh has a special part in his heart. You know. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, remarkable I, what he did. 112 days, he went from a un, an unraced horse to a, a triple crown winner. I, I we've never seen it before, and we'll probably never see that feat again. He deserves a place in history. There's no doubt about it. He's a triple crown winner. Um, I just wish, and I'd love to get your insight on this as an owner who has trained, um, you know, champions at two and horses when they're older. Do you think this sport needs the stars to stick around? Yeah. Yeah. You do. You have to have somebody to root for. I mean, listen, we we're just talking to Saul with Midnight Bisu and Matamoy Girl. I mean, people that love the sport love to be able to cheer for the horses that they love. So, I mean, and what I love here, I mean, we're back in Saratoga, which I'm so thankful for to see horses. Um, but you know, here's Sacatoga Stable, Tis the Law. Mm -hmm. Hometown heroes, right? Love that. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, people want to cheer and love horses. They do. And you know, we you do know, need to have superstars you, on occasion. You know, I get that. But uh, also economically, we, from a business standpoint, um, maybe I'm more business than you are, but uh, there are, you know, situations where you have to, it's so hard. And Saul brought up, you know, if you win 25% of the time, there's see superheroes and if, if you get an opportunity to you know monetize the value of the horse mm -hmm. so that we can continue on I'm, I'm like, so i'm maybe i'm being the bad guy but um i think <laughs> you know I, I think well you know like somebody we have a, a horse that's um turf and dirt grade tree winner that we just put in the uh uh, Fazic sell didn't sell him, but you know, he's four years old. We're going to keep him and we'll run him back and all that. But that's that's pretty unusual for us to have a, a four year old and eventually a five year old. But uh, I guess I'm sort of rambling, but I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, I think it's an interesting, it, it's an interesting it, it is. part of it to hear. And I think that people do need to to realize that for as much money as you put into the game to be able to keep going, you have to at some point in time sell some of these horses. And that's tough for fans to understand as well. It's it's um, a, a challenging line that you have to walk, I think, as an owner when you have a, a champion. Nick? I, well, I just think it's that balance, isn't it, between on one level you're trying to create the elite thoroughbred and that elite thoroughbred's championship races are when they're a three-year-old still a relatively immature horse i like the triple crown i love the romance of it i don't want to change that and make it for four-year-olds or five-year-olds even though i understand the argument for horses hanging around in training so it's that balance between trying to get the elite racehorse that you're trying to breed and produce and be a part of and really captivate the nation and that renewal and the excitement of having fresh you know i was talking to chad brown the other day um, and he was saying he was so excited about a new group of two year olds that he was going to unleash at Saratoga. It's that renewal, that freshness. But from the other end of it, the fans love the horses that hang around, which is why Monomoy Girl versus Midnight Bizu this year is going to be one of the great racing stories of the year. So if you can keep both, if you can keep both narratives going, then you're in a good space. Absolutely. But the other thing is, too, it's not just about having to have monetization of these horses. I mean, sometimes they need the time off. Yeah, you know, and, and we have to respect that, which we definitely do. But I mean, it's, you know, you have to listen and you have to, you still have to run a business, right? And you still want to have your superstars. And I think it's just finding them. I mean, look at uh, Tom Sita with uh, Al Stahl. Mm -hmm. How about this guy? I mean, it's amazing. I, I wish we had a few more of those. But sometimes you just it, it, you just don't, and I mean you get them you get them as two year olds you get to have them and they're precocious and they're superstars, and you know people want somebody to root for whether they're two three seven wherever it is. And we have some horses with Al Stahl. I argue with him all the time that <laughs> let's go, you know. <laughs> so uh, he was right on uh, Tom for sure. 
Oh, yeah, he was a Breeders' Cup winning your in classic winner for the Stephen yeah. Foster not too long ago. So it, it cheers to find that balance because let's just say it is not an easy thing to do. But um, I also think we should cheers to all the success of Starlight Racing and continued success with a drink. What do you guys Definitely. think? What are we having? Okay. So, so we need to bring him in. Okay. Bring him in. Okay. Can I get a refill while we're setting up? Yeah, okay. okay, so I've washed our lemons. And um, my rim is clean. Uh, Lauren and Jack have washed the lemons. Brittany's gone for the white burgundy out of the fridge. And uh, so our very, our very dear friend, uh, the Taylor family in Louisville, um, shared with us um, a bottle of their small batch Peerless. And we do love Maker's Market. We're here right here. So, by the way, they made the solar sidecar for us recipe. So I should. There we go. And what's in Awesome. Look at that. We have some quattro. No. Do not ask me amounts. Uh, <laughs> three or four. So we that, have there you go. fresh lemon juice, washed lemons, a clean. Wow, that looks beautiful. Uh, some peerless <laughs> bourbon. Beautiful. There we go. Now, Nick, Nick, compose yourself, okay? Try to try to just keep are. it together, all right? <laughs> Cheers, guys. That looks fantastic. I, that? I want you to I want you to watch this show back. I will. I will. <laughs> Listen, I was off. I was off camera, cracking up when you guys went back into it. <laughs> hey, Mark, are, are you are you familiar with Peerless? Peerless? No. It's so his 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 great grandfather founded the thing. He was like yeah. fifth number back in the nineteen hundreds. Okay. And then Corky just rejuvenated this thing like yeah. five years okay. ago. Yeah. And okay. It's a beautiful story. And it, it's a it's a very premium, you know. Fantastic. Yeah, whiskey. I, I got to look into it. You know, sometimes as great as New York is, we get kind of like those kind of go to sort of brands. We right. don't always get those really like fantastic stories like you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the first time that I went to Churchill Downs for the Breeders' Cup was a great experience. Being able to go around Kentucky and try some fantastic bourbons that I hadn't been great able to before. Story. So. Yeah, absolutely. So next time I have to extend my trip, maybe for Keeneland, I got to book a good two weeks so I can really soak it all in. Well, all you guys are invited to our Derby party. Hopefully, we'll we'll have authentic in the Derby and uh, and uh, go from there. And the Breeders' Cup. Awesome. That's so wonderful we, of you guys. We, I think we would love to be there. So uh, maybe in Keeneland, some place to make some cocktails all together while socially distanced. Oh yeah. 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 Lori and Jack are joining us. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Thank you well, for that. Well, that was beautiful. Us. Cheers to you guys. Cheers. And I think we all. Sorry. Cheers, Jack. Happy racing. Cash and tickets. Mm. Absolutely. And I think we're not to the birthday shot yet, but I think we're also supposed to do a happy birthday to Drew Fleming. We've got just a list of birthdays this week. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Mark, but Mark, Mark, yes. Mark, Mark. Yes. Stop right there. Stop right there. Yes. Somebody, was it your birthday yesterday? It was <gasps> my birthday yesterday. Oh, my goodness. It was. <laughs> I, did, I didn't want to draw attention to it, but I, I made sure that I had a shot on hand for the occasion. So, <laughs> well, thank you guys. I appreciate I got it. There, so I got there eventually. You did. You did. That's why we have three drinks tonight. But no, I mean, we have so much to, to celebrate in the midst of these troubling times. Still, you know, uh, during this, this time during quarantine, my younger son turned 16, my older son turned 18 and graduated from high school. Like, you can't stop celebrating milestones and appreciating one another and celebrating one another just because we're inside or somewhat limited. You have to find ways to, to keep marking those milestones. So, you know, I, I'm privileged to, to be able to do that with you guys via this show. So, and, and thanks to all of our fans that join us for all of every that. Time, yeah. Every time you mention the ages of your children, I just feel kind of sick that you look so young. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Makeup. Thank you. Like I said, I got the, you know, little makeover, but, but so we got some, I think it some was so beautifully things. stated, Mark. You have to find the good amongst all of the thank bad you. because it is there. You can find it if you look for it. So yeah. uh, thank yeah. you for that and happy birthday. Now kick us off with our next one. Yes, let's do it. So the wiki, w wiki, the whiskey smash is a very old school cocktail dating back to the 19th century. And as you'll see, it's sort of inspired or somewhat related to the julep. And some people even say it's a style of julep itself. Now, Dale DeGraff, DeGraff who actually uh, designed the recipe that we're going to be making today, he's a famous, famous bartender in this whole industry. And he says this is the perfect drink to convert non-whiskey drinkers to whiskey drinkers. I'm talking to you, Brittany Yurton. Yes, I know you're still on the fence. 
But uh, <laughs> that gold so, rush may have just pushed me straight over to the bourbon side. Yeah, whiskey the gold side. rush was was an amazing cocktail as well. You're gonna see the whiskey smash is a great whiskey cocktail, even for you know the summertime. It has some great fresh elements to it. But a quick note on Dale DeGroff because he's such an important figure in our industry. Of course, throughout the show we've highlighted so many legends in horse racing, and it's been my privilege to to be able to learn from these people, talk to them, and and hear all the knowledge they have to share. In the bartending world, we have the same thing. We've got these people that really just caused the change from the moment they came on the scene. And one of those people was Dale DeGroff. Now, Dale was basically behind the bar at the Rainbow Room in Rockefeller Center from about 1987 to 1999. And what Dale did was he basically brought back fresh ingredients to cocktails. So before then, I mean, in the 1980s, things like fresh juices and fresh fruit had been replaced almost entirely by these artificial mixers. Mm -hmm. So Dale was the one that changed that. He brought back the fresh ingredients. In many ways, he basically paved the way for this cocktail renaissance that really we're, we're still all appreciating and enjoying today. And it's probably the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. So we all owe some thanks to Dale. Um, but fun fact, Dale was actually the creator of the Belmont Breeze, which was the official cocktail of the Belmont Stakes from I believe 1997 to 2011. So he has his own tie to horse racing. Really course, full circle we, here. Full circle, absolutely. I try to put it all together. I try to sneak in some jokes for Nick to laugh at too. Let's say it was intentional. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so today to be making our whiskey smash, we are going to need Maker's Mark bourbon. We'll need some fresh, uh, so simple syrup again. We're going to need for this one, not lemon juice. We're going to want about a half a lemon that has been cut up into like three or four pieces just like that, okay? As well as some fresh mint leaves. And we're gonna want for garnish a really nice mint sprig. So a, a good rule of thumb when you're dealing with herbs, like mint especially, if you've got a beautiful sprig of mint, pick the leaves from the bottom and leave the beautiful flourish on top. That way you can kind of muddle the, the other ingredients, but you still have your really nice garnish. So that's a great way of kind of treating that herb so that you get both, both aspects. Okay, we are gonna need our cocktail shaker. We're gonna need a fine strainer. And with a name like Whiskey Smash, you already know, we're gonna need our muddler, mm. all right? Is it so, the gentle muddle? Uh, it's gonna be a combo muddle today. Whoa. <laughs> it's gonna be a hybrid that's, muddle. That's new. So we are gonna start off with our lemon pieces directly into our mixing tin. And of course, when we're doing fruits, so when we're muddling fruit, we want to extract the juices. That requires that forceful motion. We're not worried about bruising the fruit here or, you know, in the case of herbs, if you over muddle, you do get that bitterness. So we're not worried about that. Right now, we just want to extract the juices. So I've seen some recipes that actually just call for lemon juice, but I actually like the fact that Dale does it like this because it's kind of a good sort of technique to know, I guess. If you don't have a juicer on hand, there's no harm in putting those pieces of fruit in the cocktail tin, giving it a good muddle. And as you've seen, we oftentimes just strain everything towards the end of the cocktail making process anyway, so it really doesn't hurt. So now we are gonna add our mints. I would say about five to six leaves is fine, directly in our tin, as well as one ounce. Where have you put that? Is, is the mint in the, where, in the tin where you were bruising the lemons? It is, yeah, yep. It is, right, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you know what I was thinking is I should have like an elevated platform that shows yeah. you a little bit more, but we'll work on it. It's a growth, you know, we're, work in progress. We're getting there. Ned, that, we're working on that for next season. <laughs> when we have all another right. 10 ounces. yeah yep all right so one ounce of simple syrup is joining the mint and the lemon at this point we're going to give it a very gentle muddle and that is just to release some of those oils on the mint now some people say that you can even just shake mint with ice and it releases enough of those oils i like to give it a little bit of that muddle beforehand just to start the process so we were slapping the mint now we're shaking the mint Slap the mint we, we try not to abuse the mint, but yeah, the poor mint, it, it kind of take, takes a beating sometimes, but uh, <laughs> adds a lot to the flavor. So we are going to add our two ounces, uh, sorry, uh, an ounce and a half of Maker's Mark bourbon now. So that's going to go directly into our tin. Hey, Mark, I was, um, yeah. I was thinking because my parents continually ask how much to put, yeah. right? I, it was Lori was saying, she was like, oh, just a bit, sure. we'll throw it in here. And some chefs can do that. I am so much like a baker. I yeah. need the exact amounts. Um, do you think maybe we could get the amounts prior uh, 
before making all of these drinks, you know, once we like send them out, add that to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. From now on, we'll make sure that we have the, uh, the measurements for you guys. And yeah, I, you know, the thing is Ask that, so, yeah. So at bars, you may see bartenders free pouring. So it's called that when mm -hmm. you kind of just pour into the thing. But the main difference there is that you'll notice that usually they've got some sort of speed pour that's on top of this. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it regulates the flow to the point where you can learn a count system. So if you're just pouring it directly from the bottle without a speed pour on top, there's no way to regulate the count system and then your measurements are all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely recommend that everyone invest in some sort of measuring tool. I mean, so technically it's called a jigger and it typically, I mean, there are different measurements. So we've got two ounces on one side, one ounce here, and the mm -hmm. best are the ones that actually have internal markings that show the other measurements, three quarters of an ounce, half an ounce, quarter ounce, one and a half ounces. Uh, we have a new name for a horse, Jigger. It's Jigger. probably yeah. that's, that's a great you know, name just, for a horse. Just as you know, chefs need to measure everything out for us, this is a great way of keeping it consistent. For me, if someone comes to a bar and says, that's exactly the way I like the drink, I wanna know that I can replicate that exactly the same way for them. So that's the important measuring. But that's an excellent point. And I think from now on, we should absolutely have those measurements ahead of time for all of our viewers that have been so awesome in making these cocktails with us. Thank so, you. Yeah. So at this point, we are going to add some ice and we're going to shake this up. All right, guys. And then don't forget, we do still have our shot coming up. I'm going to show you the sort of crazy process that I finished this extraction of the lemon peels. But in the meantime, let's give us a good shake. Maybe we can just internally think about all the achievements of Nick Luck. Uh, one Nick Luck. Uh, okay. He's got all a right. contact. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a seven HBPA awards for, for best broadcaster. Yeah. How many do you have? Seven time broadcaster of the year in England. He has a podcast. He has uh, Luck on Sunday. He is the nicest guy I know. Who loves Chardonnay. And... I can't keep going. I'm going to stop in a minute. <laughs> All right. Three beautiful daughters, a lovely Three wife. Three beautiful Laura. daughters, yeah. Yeah. That's, that is my <laughs> finest achievement by a long way. Well, you have some this show, of course. In, in, our, in our hearts from Cocktails and this show. Nick. Yep. <laughs> All right. So we are going to strain over fresh ice here. Now, because we have muddled those lemon pieces directly in the tin, we've got things like mint that have been broken up. We absolutely want to fine strain this. I know you guys see me doing this a lot, but this is absolutely a time that we want to do it. This not this time we're not laughing at you. Um, someone would like to comment on Nick's pale forearms. This is Whoa. because it's the anniversary of the Haskell, where um, instead oh, of the usual right. suits, because of the 110 degree heat, I was made to wear one of those fetching <laughs> fetching NBC polo shirts. Which are, you know, they look great on kind of ex Olympic athletes when they're in the heat, the Olympics, track side, you know, at a, a sort of track and field or something as they're interviewing a, someone after the 100 meters. But yeah, on me, not so much. That's all good. I, well, you know, I don't tan, Nick. I always get sort of this situation. He, oh, you know look I mean? at that. He just wanted to, he just wants to show off his biceps. No, no, no. There's no biceps. It's just uneven tan here. Let's mm. slap our <laughs> mint. <laughs> And that was guys, this, like yeah. that was slightly more aggressive than normal. Yeah, you're right. You can do kind of a light tap. You know, I gotta say, Brittany has a good eye for cocktails because she always asks very good questions. You do too, Nick. But Brittany's always watching. I think she's kind of keeping me in check. Nick's just well, kind of laughing at the funny things I, I say. I kind of feel know. like I'm in school and I'm really interested in this topic. I loved chemistry, right. so it's a bit of that to me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's what keeps me interested. I mean, I've said it before, but you take any subject, but especially something that has culinary implications like this, if you really dive into it, I mean, there's a reason for everything. It's, it's to the point now where I look at a cocktail and I'm starting to think what kind of ice I want to shake that with, what size ice, how long. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot to it. And I, I genuinely feel passionate about it. You know, I love that you guys are interested in it as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fun. And at the end of the day, you get a great cocktail. So. Exactly. But that is the Whiskey Smash. Beautiful. by Dale DeGroff. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Cheers. You are some man, Mark Tuberty. And I'm looking forward to next week already. Oh, what? Hang on, though. We have a, oh, yeah. We have a birthday shot. And I, are you going to quickly just rustle up this birthday shot? Yeah. I will absolutely. save you all from um, 
my singing, so I'm not going to sing you happy birthday. <laughs> oh, good. You're going to... Right. Um... Yeah. Nick, you can sing. I know that you have some beautiful I'm the least. Vocals. I'm the least able singer in this house, that's for sure. Right. But unfortunately, everybody else is in bed. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the sound on for this, even though it's pretty mm -hmm. notoriously loud for dramatic effect. Um, so as a reminder, what what happened is in this container we've got 12 ounces of regular Tito's vodka that I combined with about the peels of sex, sex. Oh my God, the peels of six lemon lemons. Uh, Nick, you got in my head. Oh, anyway. <laughs> no, it's just been that kind of show. <laughs> six lemons, the peels in here with the vodka. We are going to take this out now. So it's under a high pressure environment. So we have two nitrogen charges that has basically forced the alcohol into the cell walls of those lemon peels. And now when I release the pressure all at once, what's gonna happen is the vodka is gonna come back out of the botanicals with all of the flavors. So this is only about 30 minutes of infusion, but it's gonna be the equivalent to if we had been letting this infuse for about a week or so. So you ready? It is going to be a little loud and a little messy. <laughs> well timed. <laughs> Too much Tito's for the birthday boy. You're absolutely right, Dorian. Uh, <laughs> So Nick, now missed we've that, got... Nick missed that little slip. Did he? I mm -hmm. think he caught it. No, he's right. just trying to be nice to me. All right, so we have our lemon peel infused vodka. I'm gonna show you the color. So this is... That's great. Yeah, this is a half an hour of infusion. So, a sample. Wow. Yeah. So now quickly to actually make this birthday shot, what we're gonna do is pour because I'm gonna make this for my wife and I, I'm gonna do three ounces of this into a mixing glass. I'm so really curious what, what the celebrity household is like Thursday nights after Marcus made so many cocktails. Oh uh, yeah, it's Just always interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Loud and messy. It's always a party. Well, the first thing is that I always have to clean up the gigantic mess that I've left here. So that's always my first, first roll. All right, we've got our- Well, at least you don't make her do it. <laughs> No, no, no. I know that this is completely on me. So, all right. So basically what we're looking for here is equal parts vodka and frangelico, which is a hazelnut liqueur. Now, in this case, we've got the citrus infused vodka. If you don't have that, feel free to use regular Tito's. But what we want is equal parts. This now, as I mentioned before, perfect. there really, really is no chocolate element of this drink. So it's a bit of a wonder that it ends up tasting like a chocolate cake sort of flavor profile but I don't know why it works, it just does. So now we're, we're gonna, gonna stir that up. All right, and the other element that you want here is you want a little wedge of lemon that's been dipped in sugar. All right, guys, so something along the lines of this, and you're just gonna dip that in the same plate of sugar that you use for the rim on the, uh, the lemon drop martini. That's all I'm gonna say. I've already gotten myself in trouble. Just gonna play it safe, stir the cocktail. All right, so now we are going to pour this into our shot glass. Apparently your wife is the best cook in Brooklyn. She is. Who said that? Kenny. I Kenny. hope somebody Kenny said again. <laughs> you, you, were right. worried that, you were worried there for a minute, weren't you? But it's just Kenny. <laughs> but she is a fantastic cook. So, guys, yeah. this is a chocolate cake shot for all the many birthdays uh, that we celebrated this past week to your mom, Brittany, uh, guys, thank you so much. Yep. So Cheers. we're gonna take the shot and then bite the lemon. Go on, in you go, That's and then bite down hard. He's yeah. encouraging it. It, it yeah. Mark, it's all Nick. Yeah. Don't ask me any more questions. It's not gonna go well. <laughs> Mark, I think this has been a tour de force. I think this has been your best performance so far. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I appreciate that. Um, we'll see you next week with <laughs> more fun frolics and a sugary rim. Mark Tuberty, thank you very much. Well, well. I, I think I, it's, I mean, it's hot in here. <laughs>
I mean, it's a, a 